Jacob has the position of authority here. We want to thank the sponsors for this week's class and lunch, Mike and Hadassah May. This is in honor of the yard site of Penina Bas Lemel Halevi. Our neshama should have an aliyah. She should go higher and higher in the heavenly worlds. It's also sponsored by the Goldshins. This is in honor of our grandsons, Bar Mitzvah and Achamendel Kahanov. Uh, big mazel tov to him and to his parents and his grandparents. He did a wonderful job. Uh, two upcoming events to announce. Next Friday night, we're having a Shabbat dinner right here in this room. Uh, the dinner will be followed by a lecture by Rabbi Mendel Duchman, who, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, and I'm making this up, has traveled more miles than any rabbi ever on the face of the earth. Um, if he's not the number one, he's definitely in the top five. Um, he is a motivational speaker, an inspirational speaker, a businessman, and a rabbi, all combined together. He has visited more Jewish communities in the world than just about anyone else. Uh, he's got fascinating stories to tell about his travels, about meeting Jews in every single part of the world. His wife, Rachel Duchman, is the daughter of Rabbi J.J. Hecht, who was one of the foremost leaders of American Jewry in his times. Uh, so together, this is a dynamic couple. They're going to be spending the entire Shabbat with us. Friday night dinner, then a talk by them, and then all day Shabbat. He'll be giving the sermon, and then after the Kiddush lunch, they'll each be speaking as well for the men and for the women. So please... Next Friday evening, March 8th, and Shabbat, March 9th, we look forward to having you join with us. On Monday, March 11th, we're flying in Jacqueline Saper. She was born in uh, Tehran. Uh, her father was uh, an Iranian father, a British mother. She was there for the civil unrest, for the takeover by the Ayatollah. She talks about what life was like for the women of Iran, specifically for the Jewish women of Iran during the revolution and the years thereafter, hiding in basements in order to survive with her little children. Uh, and she's talking about also today what's going on in Iran, Iran today, the revolt that's being led by courageous women in the streets of Tehran and the streets of Iran. So please uh, spread the word, Jacqueline Saper, she was actually named after Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis by her mother who had this vision of having a daughter uh, grow up to be like Jacqueline Kennedy. Um, Monday, March 11th, 7.30 p.m. is the start time for this lecture. Please join us yourself and spread the word to others. So as I mentioned last week, today and next week, we're going to be focusing on, on one of the most puzzling biblical stories. There are many, public, uh, many different biblical stories that are puzzling, but this one is always right up there when you ask people which stories of the Bible uh, they have the most questions on. This is always one of those that are there. The reason we're studying this here as we're in the middle of studying the book of Deuteronomy and the story takes place in the book of Genesis is because we hit this verse in the book of Deuteronomy that talks about false prophets and there God says that just because a false prophet provides for you wonders and miracles and predictions that come true, that doesn't mean you believe them. It means that God is testing you, God's challenging you to see if you're going to follow in God's ways or not. And it's on that verse where we have the, that God makes a statement that he does challenge us, and we want to delve into this idea of why does God challenge us? Why do we have to go through the challenges of faith in our life? Why can't just accept, accept us for who we are? Why do we have to go through so many of the difficulties in life that we say because God is testing us, God's challenging on us. In order to enter into this conversation properly, I felt let's take a moment, a pause, and go back to this biblical story that takes place in the book of Genesis called The Binding of Isaac. Now, for those of you here in the room, I did put out some handouts. For those of you that are either on Zoom or Facebook, our uh, friend here, Jay, um, Jacob, yes, Jacob. I'm a year older, and that's it. The mind is, is, is gone. Turned 61 and nothing left. I'm a baby, yes, yes. Jacob, that's his name. So he's going to be putting it up on the screen for you. Those watching on YouTube, I do not think you're going to see the text that is being put up on Zoom, and so you're just going to have to listen closer. 
But I think the best thing really to do to get into it is to read the story. Just actually read it from the text. And then we're going to go back and really digest it. So if you are on the YouTube link and you're watching this there, simply go to your browser, go to Chab type in the word Chabad, Genesis chapter 22. It'll pop up for you. You'll be able to follow it there. Um, for the rest of you, it's page one of the handout. And Jacob, you have it. You have it. Very good. So we're just going to read through this chapter, and then we're going to dissect it. Verse 1, Vayihi achar hadvorah me'ela, sometime after the events of chapter 21, God put Abraham to the test, saying to him, Abraham, and he answered, Hineni. That's Abraham's classic response. Hineni doesn't just mean here I am, it's here I am and I'm ready. It's whatever you have for me, God, I'm ready. Verse 2, all right, how ready are you? Take your son, your favorite son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the heights that I will point out to you. Verse 3. So early next morning, Abraham saddled his donkey and took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. He split the wood for the burnt offering and he sent, uh, set out a place of which, from which God had told him. On the third day, uh, Abraham looked up and he saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his servants, you stay here with the donkey, the boy and I will go up there, we will worship and we'll return to you. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and he put it on his son Isaac. He himself took the fire stone and the knife and the two walked off together. Then Isaac said to his father, Abraham, to his father Abraham, Father? And he answered, Yes, my son. And he said, Here are the fire stone. Here is the wood. I see that. But where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Or a more modern day vernacular, for those that remember the commercial from the Mondale versus Hart campaign, where's the beef? I see all the other ingredients. I don't see an animal. By the way, he's not a little kid. He's 37 years old. Isaac is 37 years old at the time, so don't have this vision of this little child. Verse 8, and Abraham said, It is God who will see to the sheep for this burnt offering, my son. God's going to pick who's going to be the offering. And the two of them walked on together. Verse 9, they arrived at the place of which God had told them, Abraham built an altar there, he laid out the wood, he bound his son Isaac, he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Verse 10, and Abraham picked up the knife to slay his son. Is there anyone here that doesn't know the end of the story? <laughs> Verse 11, then the messenger of God called out to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he answered, Hineni, here I am. <laughs> Do not raise your hand against the boy. Do not do anything for him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your favorite one, from me. When Abraham looked up, his eyes fell upon a ram caught in the thicket by its horn. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham named the site Hashem Yireh, hence the present saying, On that mountain of God there is vision. The messenger of God called to Abraham a second time from heaven. And he said, by myself I swear, God declares, because you have done this, have not withheld your son, your favorite one, I will bestow my, bless my blessings upon you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands on the seashore. And your descendants shall seize the gates of their foes. All the nations of earth shall bless themselves by your descendants because you have obeyed my command. Abraham then returned to his servants, and they departed together for Be'er Sheva, and Abraham stayed in Be'er Sheva. I know you have questions, so just hold on to them. Give me this week and next week to try to answer all of your questions, and whatever I don't answer by then, we'll have a question and answer session then. So for now, hold on, because I know there are many questions. We find that Abraham was not just tested one time in his life. We know Asura Nisyonos that he had 10 different times 
that God challenged him. Va'onmad bechulam, it says. He uh, was able to withstand all of them. He tested him ten times, and Abraham passed all ten. So before we begin to analyze the binding of Isaac, I think I want to take a step back and try to understand what is a test? What does it mean, a test? So let's start with a simple question. Let us suppose you're a teacher in a school and you're giving your students an exam, a test. Why are you doing it? Why is a teacher testing the students? So let's pick a number of reasons. Number one, the teacher needs to know if the students are getting it. If the teacher sees that no one understood anything of the last month, well, something is wrong. Maybe you're going over their head. Maybe you're boring. Maybe the subject is too difficult. Something has to change. So the test is not always just because we want to go after the kids. A real good teacher wants to know what's getting through. What are they digesting? So reason number one is for the teacher. The teacher to see what the student knows. Number two is to see the effectiveness of the types of lesson the teacher is giving. So the teacher will see on this set of subject questions, they all got it right. But on this set, they didn't. Well, the teacher will be able to glean from that what's right and what's wrong, what's working and what's not. Number three is it forms some type of challenge for the student. When you hear the teacher say, in three days' time, there's going to be an exam, what do you do that night? You're going to be less on your cell phone, less on the TV, less on playing sports, and you're going to hit the books. If you care about your grade, when you know there's going to be an exam, you study. And so there is the challenging of the student when the teacher puts an exam that the student will apply themselves more. It also forms some type of motivation for the student to pay attention during the regular lessons. If a teacher says, this year, no exams, now the teacher will get an applause. The students will like that teacher. But what will happen is, if you doze off in class, you won't care as much because I'm not getting tested anyway. So if there's no ultimate score here, if I pay attention, good. If I don't, not. So there's a certain motivational factor of a benefit that the students will pay attention more if there's a test. Next, a comparison of students. A teacher, a good teacher, needs to know which students are stronger, which students are weaker, so that the, pay, the teacher could pay more attention to those that need more attention. And so a teacher will get some type of understanding by the grades, perhaps after a second or a third test, a pattern will develop of which students are struggling more and which students are excelling. And again, a good teacher will use that to help for the future as well. To monitor progress in the students, going from grade to grade, each semester is the student improving, is the student not improving, is the student falling back. So these are all reasons that a regular teacher in school would test a student. If we use that terminology of test with the story of Abraham, most of these explanations make little sense. Because if God knows all, and if God knows Abraham, and if God knows the future, why test? Especially when we deal with the test such as the binding of Isaac. Because the binding of Isaac must have brought about with it anguish. You tell him, even a man of great faith that you're going to have to do this and bring your son as an offering, you're causing him pain. So it's not as if there's nothing to be lost by this. There's three days of struggle on Abraham's part. Why put Abraham through it if you know the end result? If you're God and you're infinite and you know the end result, you know he's going to pass it, why do it? Perhaps we can have a better understanding if we look at the Hebrew word that the Torah uses when it talks about God testing us, challenging us. The word that the Torah uses is nisayon. 
Now that word comes from the word nes. Nes, which you always use as a terminology for a miracle, but really the root word of the word nes is a pole. That's a banner. Something which stands up high that people can see from a distance. So we call a miracle a nes because everyone stops to pay attention. So that which you use as a flag, as a banner, as a flagpole for people to see, that which is visible, that which is recognizable from afar, we call nes. So the nesayon, the tests that God puts Abraham are called banners. They're flagpoles. They're things that people stop and take notice of. So therefore, the nesayon is not a test that exists for the tester, it's not for God's sake. It's not for God that God needs to know, because God knows, God knew. It's for the one that's being tested to know. So I want to take a look now at chapter 18 of the book of Genesis. It's verse 17. In the papers that I gave you, it's page 3. On the top of the page, it says text number 2. Those in YouTube world, just listen closely. You won't be missing much. It's okay if you don't have it in front of you. And God said, Shall I conceal from Abraham that what I'm about to do? Let me set the scene for all of you. God has decided that he's going to destroy the cities of Sodom. They're wicked, and he's going to wipe them out. He's going to turn these cities upside down. That verdict has been reached by God. He sends three angels into the world. Remember that part of the story? Some of the, the task of the angels is going to be to destroy Sodom. One is going to be to heal Abraham after the circumcision. One is going to be to inform Sarah that she's going to have a baby boy. They have missions. Part of the mission is to destroy Sodom. And suddenly the Torah in chapter 18 does something it does not ordinarily do. And that's the beauty of this paragraph. It has the author, God, talking to himself. Usually the author is talking to the audience. He's talking to Abraham. He's talking to Moses. He's talking to us, the people, as he did at Sinai. Here, the author talks to himself and records that conversation that he had with himself for all of us to know what he was saying to himself. When you talk to yourself, you're generally speaking the deepest aspect of your thoughts. When I speak to you, I'm filtering. Anything I'm saying now is going through a quick filter process. I'm selecting words to say. But if I'm only talking to myself, I don't have to filter anything, because it's all within the mind. So when the Torah says, and God said, and he's speaking to himself, it's telling us this is very dear to God in God's mind. It's high up there in God's mind. What does he say to himself? Shall I conceal from Abraham that which I'm about to do? I'm not going to tell Abraham that I'm going to destroy Sodom. And Abraham, again, this is still God, part of this conversation, will surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth will bless themselves through him. And I know him. Isn't that interesting? I know him. He will command his children and his household after him that they keep the ways of God, doing charity and justice in order that God might bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. I know this fellow. He's good. Not only is he good, he's going to succeed in passing this on to his children, his great grandchildren all the way through. Therefore, I'm giving him this land of Israel. I'm giving him this whole mission statement. He's about to become the chosen people. And I'm going to destroy part of Israel without sharing it with him in advance? Ah, that wouldn't be right of me. So let me share it with Abraham. And then the next chapter, God speaks to Abraham and tells him what he's about to do. And what does Abraham say? How could you do such a thing? If there's 50 righteous people, can we spare them? Yes, God says, what about 45? Yes, what about 40, 30, 20, 10? It turns out they're going to get destroyed. But it's interesting that it's introduced to us with this paragraph 
where God says, I know him. If he knows him, it means he knows he's going to pass every test. That's what he told us. This chapter, chapter 18, is before the binding of Isaac takes place. So you already told us, the audience, that you know him, that you know he's going to succeed in following you, you know he's going to succeed in passing all of this on to his children and his great-grandchildren thereafter. <coughs> so if you know, why do you have to put him through this test? The answer, as I said, is not for God's knowledge. It's not for God's benefit. It's for Abraham's benefit. It's for our benefit. It's for the world's benefit. You see, there's many potentials that we have that are never actualized until they're tested. Let's pick an athlete. If Michael Jordan didn't grow up where he grew up, and if he didn't ever play basketball as a kid, what if he had been Michael Jordan? Not Michael Jordan. The title, the, the, the skill is there, the talent is there, but if it was never brought out from him, it may have just stayed there. How many human beings could have been great artists, but never tried, never went to art school, or never even thought that they had the possibility. Maybe they didn't like art, so they never tried. It doesn't mean the talent wasn't there. Which means there's a good chance that here in this room could have been a home run hitter that we just never knew about. We could have been better than Otani. We could have gotten a big contract. We just didn't try. There are skills, there are talents that are inborn. Sometimes they're brought out. Now what brought it out? How did you find the skill? Someone challenged you. Something challenged you. Maybe a teacher challenged you. Maybe a teacher gave you an assignment and you said, there's no way I can do it. And the teacher says, I believe in you. Yes, you can. Try. Just try. Maybe a parent challenged you. Maybe a coach challenged you. Maybe a friend challenged you. Maybe circumstances challenged you. And it may have been negative circumstances that challenged you. But it challenged you. And what you found from that challenge is, hey, I have this skill I never knew I had. <coughs> when do we push ourselves to the limit? When we have to. If we don't have to, do we push ourselves? Quite often not. When we're faced with the demands of a test, of a challenge, in order for Abraham to succeed at his mission, and it's not just an individual mission, it's a lifelong mission of Abraham and all of his descendants afterwards that goes on till this day with us in this room. For us to succeed at this mission, for Abraham to succeed at starting off this mission, he needed to have been brought, we call min hakoach el hapoel, from potential to actuality. God knew what he had in him. God knew his potential. God knew every challenge that he would put onto Abraham, what the result would be. But Abraham didn't know. The audience didn't know. The world didn't know. That Abraham had tremendous strength, yes. Faith, yes. Conviction, confidence, character, all of that, yes. But was it put into practice? That's what the ten challenges of Abraham's faith were about. <coughs> Showing Abraham what he really had, showing us what Zaidi and Bubby had, so that we knew from where we came, so that we can answer the question, why was Abraham and Sarah chosen? So that we have the storyline, so that the storyline gets passed on to us, to our children, to our grandchildren, and onwards all the way. Then, and only then, could the descendants of Abraham be successful. Each of the trials and tribulations of the Abraham went through, each of the ten challenges of faith, further developed another dimension of Abraham's relationship with God, allowing it to mature and allowing it to blossom. 
We're going to get back to this idea of dimensions next week. What I'm going to do next week is I'm going to show you how the story of the binding of Isaac has to be studied on many separate dimensions, one building upon the other. For now, let's go to reading number one, page number three. We're still studying the story leading up to the binding of Isaac. Reading number one comes from the Medrash, and it says, God will test the righteous one, Rabbi Yonatan said, when the linen maker beats the flax, he does not beat the weakened flax too much, lest it split. But when the flax is of high quality, he beats it more to make it finer. So God doesn't test the wicked, who are not able to withstand it. So God brings out this high quality of the righteous through the life experiences of the righteous, which allow them to maximize their potential. Reading number two. Our father Abraham was tested ten times, and he withstood them all to indicate how great was Abraham's love for God. And reading number three, we're going to start going through what were the ten tests of Abraham. We know the binding of Isaac was number ten. What were the prior nine? And I'll do these quickly. The first one <coughs> goes back to the days of King Nimrod. King Nimrod is the king when Abraham is a little boy, when he's growing up. Abraham's father Terach worshipped the king because the king made himself as if he was a god. Abraham, as a young child, doesn't believe that a human being is God. He believes there's a God that's a creator of everything that he sees. And he refuses to bow to King Nimrod as a god. King Nimrod threatens to kill Abraham by throwing him into a furnace because Abraham refuses to bow to his idols. Abraham prefers to die rather than betray his belief in the creator of the universe. So his first challenge of faith starts early on in his, in his youth where he refuses to give in to idol worship, he refuses to bow to an idol, he refuses to accept Nimrod as a king, and his life is put on the line. This test takes place before God ever appears to Abraham. So it's an individual, a human being, coming to a conclusion, a realization, that there are things in life worth dying for. That life without certain ideals is not living at all. And for a Jew, life without God, life without faith, denies life its meaning. So as a, at a very young age, Abraham already is challenged and passes that challenge. A miracle happens for him, he's thrown into a fiery furnace, nothing happens to him. Test number two, that we're more familiar with, it opens the third portion of the book of Genesis. It's called Lech Lecha where God will come to Abraham and he will tell him, I need you to leave your land, leave your family, leave your friends, leave your birthplace, and I'm going to wander to a strange land. Lech Lecha, I want you to leave this place, and you're going to go. The journey begins, and really that's where the mission begins. That's the first communication in the text of the Torah of God with Abraham, and he tells him, we're going to start something new. But it's not going to be here. You're leaving, which is present-day Iraq, and you're going to be traveling to what we know as to be Israel. And there I'm going to start something new with you. This trial taught Abraham that to have a close relationship with God and the unique one, he has to be prepared to leave his comfort zone. His natural tendencies, his habits, his preconceived perceptions, and that's what all these words mean. I need you to leave your birthplace, Artsecha, Meilatetecha, Beis Avicha. All of that which you're used to was starting something new. You're going to be a stranger in a strange land, but that's how we're going to start. <coughs> so, test number three comes along. Abraham trusts God, and he ventures on this unspecified journey. It culminates with his arrival in the land of Canaan. What happens as soon as he gets there? There's a famine in the land. As he arrives, a famine breaks out in the land. Before he even has a chance to settle, he is forced to wander to another land. There is an expectation. If God was to come to you and tell you, I'm sending you on a mission. I need you to leave this place and go to place B. 
the expectation would be that when you arrive at that other destination, good things will happen. It's the, the normal expectation. God came to me and told me to leave here and go here. Obviously, something good's going to happen. But what happens if I get to that destination and things get much worse than they were before? That's exactly what happens with Abraham. He's told to leave Iraq, not the easiest place to live perhaps, travel to Israel. He arrives in Israel, which is then called the land of Canaan, and suddenly, as soon as he arrives, a famine breaks out. There's no food. How do we get food? In order to get food, we've got to go down to Egypt. That's the only place that's selling food right now. And yet, we don't find Abraham complaining. The man of faith just goes with the flow. He comes here. He did what he, what he was asked to do. And now in order to get food, I have to go there. I'll go there. We would have the same expectation throughout history. God gave us 613 commandments. That's a lot of commandments. He gave us a lot of laws, a lot of things to study. And the expectation would be that if we follow all of them, it's all going to be easy. Life is going to be easy. We're not going to have to go earn a living because we're doing what God wants us to do. So it's just going to rain down from heaven. Our paycheck will just come in the mail. You imagine the surprise at Sinai when they're hearing all these commandments, and then they also hear, and you're going to go out and have to make a living. I could imagine, the hint, what, what, what does that mean, make a living? I thought you just said we're to be a nation of priests and a holy nation, and you started telling us commandment 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 4, 613 commandments. That's our job. And then you're telling us about farming the land, and you're telling us about plowing the land, and you're also telling us that when we farm the land and we do the work, oh, by the way, the first three years, you can't eat any of the fruit from the tree. Oh, by the way, the corners of the field don't belong to you. Oh, by the way, that which falls, you have to leave for the poor. Law after law after law after law. So nowhere was it written in our contract that God's guaranteeing everything to be easy. He's saying it's going to be blessed. There'll be purpose. There'll be meaning. Ultimately, you'll change the world. But easy was not one of the words he used. And so that's being shown to Abraham early on. You arrive in the land of Canaan, there's going to be difficulties. And you think that the world is going to fall in love with you because you're a light unto the nations. That's a whole another chapter. So what happens now? He comes down to Egypt. Challenge number four takes place. Pharaoh abducts Sarah. His wife is taken by Pharaoh. He goes down to Egypt to find food. His wife is kidnapped by Pharaoh. Ma'asa avot simul abanim, the microcosm of what Abraham and Sarah go through and what the Jewish people will eventually go through as we will deal with Pharaoh later in Egypt as a nation, as we will be kidnapped by Pharaoh, so to say. And just like <coughs> Pharaoh had to release Sarah, Pharaoh will have to release us. Just like Pharaoh released Sarah with many gifts, God will, uh, Pharaoh would release the Jewish people with many gifts. But that's, again, living in the storyline of Abraham and Sarah. That's his fourth challenge that he goes through. What's number five, the fifth challenge of Abraham's life? <coughs> Upon hearing of the capture of his nephew, Lot. He had a nephew. His name was Lot. Lot and Abraham separated, parted ways. They moved together from Iraq. When they got to the land of Canaan, they each went their own separate way. Lot's shepherds, Abraham's shepherds didn't get along, and so they went their own separate ways. A world war takes place, and in that war, Lot is kidnapped. Lot is taken prisoner. And Abraham is faced with the choice of risking his life by going to war, a war that he would be vastly outnumbered, against a group of powerful kings and their armies, or does he just leave Lot to his fate, whatever happens? And Abraham will get involved, and he will get involved in the battle, and he will rescue his nephew as well. Number six in a vision, we spoke about this last week. We spoke about the deep vision of Abraham where he had the covenant between the parts, I called it, where he was able to visualize and see all the different difficulties, the clouds that will face his descendants, the Jewish people throughout history. That was his sixth challenge where he was shown all the difficulties he was shown Jewish history. He was shown the suffering of the Jewish people. 
and he was also shown the future glory days. But for a compassionate grandfather, a Zayda like Abraham, to see what his children would go through was a challenge for his faith. Was he going to come out of this and say, God, this isn't right, this isn't fair, I, th th this can't go on. Instead, Abraham, the man of faith, accepts it. Number seven. God commands Abraham to circumcise himself at the age of 99 years old. He could have said, you sure? <laughs> exactly where are we talking? <laughs> what will the neighbors say? <laughs> so, long as this, the man is all about sharing and caring and hospitality, the neighbors could say, he's nice, he's a sweet old man. But when the neighbors will hear what he's about to do because God asked him to do it, they're going to question his sanity. <laughs> Reading number four tells a, a little bit of a Hasidic story about it. It says uh, that when my father uh, was four or five years old, he went to his grandfather. This is written by one of the Chabad Rebbe's, the Tzamach Tzedek, on Shabbos Vayera, and he began to cry. And the little, this little boy, ask, who grew up to become a Rebbe himself, asks his grandfather, why did God show himself to our father Abraham, but he didn't show himself to us? And God appears to Abraham, I keep reading God appeared, he doesn't appear to me. And his grandfather answered him, when the tzaddik decides at the age of 99 that he should be circumcised, he deserves that God should appear unto him. It's like, hey, when we get to that level, then we can ask the question. Number eight was one Avimelech, similar story to Pharaoh, but this time it's closer to home. It's a similar trial to trial number three, but Gerar was a neighboring land. It was considered more lawful, it was considered more sophisticated, and yet the same problem takes place there of steeped in immorality, and Sarah again is kidnapped, taken by Avimelech this time, and this is close to the people, to the land of Israel, and again, a challenge of Abraham's faith. Number nine. I need to slow down with number nine because, as I said, next week I'm going to build my dimensions and I'm going to use story number nine, test number nine, over and over again next week. So I need you to pay attention to it because we're going to come back to it. The story is, is very important if we want to truly grasp the importance of the binding of Isaac. We have to talk about what happens right before the binding of Isaac. Abraham and Sarah... They don't have any children, at least not yet. Sarah has a maid. Her name is Hagar. Sarah reasons to herself, why should Abraham go through life childless? After all, God has constantly told him he's going to be the father of a new nation, a father of a new nation. And God says that your children will, descend, will inherit the land, which means there has to be children. I'm not providing any children for him. No children. So she comes up with the surrogate mother plan. I'll be the surrogate mother. Marry my maid. And if she gives birth, I'll raise the child as my own. And this way, you, Abraham, will have a child. Abraham listens to his wife. And he marries Hagar. And Hagar gets pregnant. And the moment she gets pregnant, she stops seeing herself as the maid of Sarah. And she starts thinking to herself, hey, she didn't have children with him all these years. I just get married to him and right away I'm pregnant. I'm the righteous one here. I'm the chosen one. I'm the selected one. And she begins to look down upon Sarah because she's the one having the baby. Conflict breaks out between the two, between Hagar and Sarah. Hagar will run away from home. An angel will find her and will send her back. She will eventually give birth. I think you all know the child's name. His name? Ishmael. Ishmael. We still know his descendants quite well. Ishmael will grow up in the house with Abraham and Sarah 
and Hagar. 13 years later, Ishmael is now 13 years old. Abraham is visited by these three angels and he is told that he's going to have a child with Sarah. That this wasn't the child that God was envisioning as the future of the Jewish people. The angel says, I will return next year at this time and the Hine Bain Lesara, Sarah will have a son. Abraham says this, Oi, Lu Yishmal Yichya Lefanecha. Lu Yishmal Yichya Lefanecha means, Oh, that Ishmael would walk before you. Abraham reasons to himself. Cyrus, thinking 13 years earlier, made some sense. Surrogate motherhood. And he has this child. He loves Ishmael. It's his only child. When the angel comes and says that next year Sarah is going to have a child, in his mind that meant that Ishmael was rejected. That there's something wrong with Ishmael's behavior. And his focus right away is on the pain of a father hearing that his son Ishmael is not going on the right path. So he immediately asks God for a blessing. Oh, that Ishmael walked before you. And God reassures him that this was always part of the plan. There was always going to be a son to Sarah. As for your request, as far as Ishmael, he too will become a great nation, a nation that will survive history, but he's not the one we're talking about. The one that will change the world, the one that will take this mission on, that's going to be the son that will be born from Sarah. A year later, Sarah gives birth to a miraculous child. She's 90 years old. Abraham was 100 years old. They named the child Isaac, which means laughter. As the children are growing up, Sarah sees how Ishmael is a bad influence on young Isaac. Her main task is to protect Isaac. Isaac cannot grow up like Ishmael. There's too much riding on the shoulders of Isaac. And she tells Abraham, send him and his mother away. They shouldn't live here. Let them find another address. That was very hard for Abraham. He loves his son. He loves Ishmael. It's his boy. He loves Isaac too, but he loves Ishmael. It doesn't say it, but perhaps he had feelings for Hagar as well. We know he will remarry Hagar after Sarah will pass away. He'll bring her back and get married again to her. So God has to come to Abraham and say this to him. Be not distressed over the youth or your maid. Don't be distressed about what has to happen now with Ishmael or with Hagar. Whatever Sarah is telling you to do, listen to her voice. You follow what Sarah is telling you. Since it is Isaac that will be your offspring. But as for the son of the maid, I will also make him into a nation since he is your offspring. This was an extremely difficult challenge for Abraham. This was hard for him to accept. That he needed to tell his son Ishmael and Ishmael's mother Hagar to leave home. Send them away. It was extremely difficult for him. That was challenge number nine. Which led to challenge number ten. When now Isaac is 37 years old, God instructs Abraham to offer Isaac as a sacrifice to him upon the mountain, which began with the story that we read to start class. So next week, we start building our dimensions. What's the difference between challenge number 10 and everything that came before it? Why is that considered the ultimate challenge of faith of Abraham? We'll see you all next week. There's lunch for everybody.